Stuck. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're continuing on in our Bible study in Mark, and last week we left there off to be anything here under Mark. chapter 1, verse uh, 11. If you want to hand me the Bible, I'll, I'll turn it there. And this week we're going to continue on Mark, no, Mark um, chapter 1, verse 12 is where we're going to I mean, pick I'm, up. I'm looking at, at the index at the very beginning. They might mess that up. To, yeah. To see where... Which page should I go? It's all out of order. That's a bad index. Uh, um, I'll get you there. Lightning speed. But that's what it should be, right? Yes. Yeah. Chapter 1. Oh, well. Using <laughs> Mark technique. Yes. <laughs> Mark's abbreviated fast moving technique. Okay, let's go ahead and go on to verse 12. And I'm going to read the verse after that, number 13 as well. So Mark is talking and he says, Immediately, so there's that word again. Again, this book is going to be hallmarked with words like that because Mark is a very fast paced and moving book. It says, Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. So now we need to unpack that and talk about what's going on because, again, Mark is the abbreviated version. The word drove. What are they talking about, Jesus? Yes. Um, the word drove, the Holy Spirit drove him. In, Mar in Matthew and in Luke, the phrase is, was led by the Spirit. But we have to remember the, the picture Mark paints for us of the Messiah is that of a servant. Remember, Matthew talks about him as the Messiah. Um, Mark as a servant. Luke presents him as king and a man. The man king, that's why he has that genealogy, a kingly genealogy. John presents him as deity. Okay, God the Son. And so in Mark's rendition, when you have words like this, um, it, re it, it reflects back on that servant nature of Christ. He came to serve, not to be served. So that's why it says here that the Spirit drove him out into the wilderness. It's the same Greek word used when it says that Jesus cast out demons. It was that kind of a, that strength of a term. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, it means literally to cast out from within. So wherever the Lord was, he was cast out from that area by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. Um, verse 13 speaks of the present tense as in a continuous action. So during the 40 days, um, it was a continual temptation. He was put to the test. And the, again, what that literally means, when Satan did this to people, when he tried them and tested them, it was to see what good or evil was would naturally come out of a person under pressure. Kind of like Job. Job was tested and tried to see what character, what would come out of him. Um, there was another time the Lord, I think it was to Hezekiah, left him to see what would come out of him. Um, and it was not, not good in that case. The region where he was, was they think it was around um, Jericho. That region abounded with boars, wild boars, Jackals, wolves, foxes, leopards, and hyenas, and lacked food. Which number are you reading? I'm reading my notes right now. Oh. I'm explaining. We're talking about verses 12 and 13, when the Holy Spirit drove him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil 40 days. Um, in, my notes, in my notes, I wrote that Adam failed in a perfect environment, and I posed the question in my notes, would the last Adam pass in this wild environment. Yes, he did. Angels ministered. Again, um, this infers a constant ministering, that during this time of temptation, angels ministered to him. Well, was this kind of, in a way, was this cheating? No, I don't think so. Because in the way that they ministered, from what I understand, it was the exact way is unknown. None of us were there. We don't know exactly what was going on. But what I would lean towards is the way the angels were ministering to him was like Daniel in the lion's den. Because he's out in the wilderness with all these wild animals. And so maybe they were shutting their mouths like they shut the mouth of the lion 
in the lion's den. So but regardless, I think they weren't helping him in any other way but keeping it fair. Okay? Shutting the mouths of the wild animals, things like that. Um, verses 14 and 15 say this. Verse 14 says, Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And I'm going to read from my notes real quick here. Time. The word time there, where Jesus says the time is fulfilled, mm -hmm. that's not talking about the Greek word chronos, which means like in a clock. That's another time. Um, it means as in an epic or a time period. It's a time frame. Like now is the time. Not necessarily, oh, it's 3.30, we need to start the, the clock here and go on live. Um, but this is, it's now the time for this. Um, marked by an epic event. Well, we know what that epic event was. The Messiah had come. <laughs> I'm going to turn real quick to Galatians 4.4 4 because Galatians 4.4 4 has a similar usage of that same word, time. Galatians 4.4 4 says, But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, under the law. So when the fullness of time, when, when it was time, when, when it was the right time, and it was the perfect time, the size of the world was perfect, Rome had built roads everywhere, the whole world was connected. Basically, that was their internet. Um, the Roman roads connected everybody, everywhere. So it, they were all speaking similar, not maybe one language, but they all had a fluency in languages. Many people spoke Greek. Those same people spoke Roman or Italian. Those same people spoke Hebrew and other languages. They all shared. And so you might find some people separated by thousands of miles, but they spoke one of those languages. And they might know a language that some people a thousand miles away after them spoke. So they were all connected in a way, in one way or the other. So the perfect time was now for the Messiah to come. Uh, the time of the law was fulfilled. And, and now it was a time for change. So you, so you having, having a change of mind, is what repentance means, regarding your sinful past should put your faith in the message of the good news is literally what that phrase is meaning. So the law was fulfilled. So who was the last Old Testament prophet? John the Baptist. Was the last Old Testament prophet. It's kind of a trick question. Like, What's our closest star? The sun. <laughs> um, John the Baptist was, he was it. He had finished it. The Old Testament was done. The law was finished under Christ. He completed it. So now this, there was an epic event. The Messiah is here, God the Son. And he's saying, stop everything. I'm preaching the good news. The kingdom of God has come. Now, what, what, the way he taught was like that. He was always elusive when referring to himself. What that meant was, you cannot have a kingdom without a king. Yep. The king had come. But he always spoke in those elusive kind of terms uh, not saying, hey, I'm the king, I've come. He would say, the kingdom of God has come. But we know the inference, the king has come. Believe the good news. Let's go ahead and read 16, 17, and 18. Mark chapter 1, verse 16. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. And I hope that you really caught that word, become, because that indicates a process. Nobody is born again and is instantly a full-on disciple, disciple capable of discipling other Christians. It is a process. These guys spent three years with Jesus. 
and they still weren't ready. Disciple. Well, actually, what was Jesus doing? <laughs> he was going disciple shopping. <laughs> shopping for his disciples, picking them out. You two, Peter and Andrew, you two, James and John. Um, so where did he go disciple shopping? Did he go to Harvard? Princeton? Berkeley? Yale? No. Did he go to Forbes' list of the most successful people? No. Where did he go? He went to the seashore for common, average, everyday fishermen. Common laborers. The kind you would see standing on the road as you drive by waiting to get picked up to do a job. Day laborers. Common laborers is what Jesus took and entrusted to these 12 men the whole gospel. And then he left and put all the, everything in their hands and left it. Intrigued by the offer, these disciples dropped everything and followed another common laborer, the carpenter, because they were intrigued by his invitation. They were intrigued by that promise of becoming a fisher of men. How strange. They knew the art of fishing. They were experts at it. But he said, hey, follow me. Follow me, the simple, rugged carpenter, and I will teach you guys. I'll make you to become fishers of men. So it does indicate a process over time. And even after three years of being with him, they were still making mistakes, like arguing who would be the greatest, wanting to call it on fire, chopping up people's ears, lacking of faith, etc. So they, they still, even after three years, had growing to do. The point, you must spend time with the master if you want to be used as a servant. You must spend time with the master in order to be a good servant. And it takes a level of commitment to forsake all, to leave their income, to leave everything, and become what he wanted. This was, if you remember the four seed types, they were becoming seed type number four. They were presently, if you want, kind of caught up in number three, distracted with the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and making an income and stuff like that. He was going to take them and transform them into number four to become good ground, to bear fruit, some 100, some 30, some 60-fold. Um, verses 19 and 20, and I have a really, really short note, so we're going to skip, we're not going to skip anything, but we're going to move fast through them. Verses 19 and 20, he had gone a little further from there and saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat mending their nets, and immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after them. So they had a good business, and they left their father, they left the business, they left the hired help, and left. The interesting thing about these two is, um, the first two were called as fishers of men, fishermen. These two were called as what? Menders, menders of nets. And it's kind of weird but when you look at their lifestyle, the majority of, of what they did, the hallmark, if you will, is Peter and Andrew fished the people in. James and John mainly were menders of the church, fixers, fixer uppers of the church, repairers. You read the book of James, he set some stuff straight in there, very point blank. He said, hey, you guys think you got it under control? Let me tell you what, you don't control this eye, your tongue, you got nothing under control. James was very down to earth, rubber meets the road. He didn't teach like it, like Paul taught um, philosophically. He like demonstrated rubber meets the road. You want to be a Christian? Let me show you how to do it. This is how you do it. So the fishers were called and they were made fishermen. The menders were called and made mendermen if you will. We're going to read verses 21 through 28, and believe it or not, that's all we're going to read today. We're going to go over a lot, a lot of stuff. So verse 21, then they went to Capernaum, and immediately, huh, on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. 
And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region of Galilee. So like I said, immediately his fame spread. Um, because like I said, in those days, their roads and word of mouth was their internet. It just, whoosh, and it spread. So backing up a little bit, let's start from the very beginning of that passage where it talked about the synagogue. In those days, not everybody could get to the temple every Sabbath. So they set up little Sunday school type things, if you will. Uh, throughout the region and called them synagogues. They were not the temple, but they were places where they could gather together and partake of uh, praise, prayer, reading of the scriptures, and rabbinical teaching. And often guests would come in, and if you were a competent guest, you were invited. If you had something to say, you could do a reading and speak on it. Um, but these things both Jesus and Paul did. They both went into these synagogues and were invited and spoke and taught. The Greek for the word taught in this, in this instance indicates that it was a lengthy discourse that the Lord gave. So, And as you can imagine, as he gave this lengthy discourse, they were all on the edge of their seats with pins and needles because he wasn't talking to them as their other teachers did. When the rabbis taught, they would say, now let's talk about uh, the writing that Moses gave about divorce. Now, Rabbi so-and-so taught about this, and he said when you want to divorce somebody, all you have to do is just give him a writing of a divorcement. Even if she burns the toast, it really doesn't matter. You just say, I divorce you and get her out of the way, and you're good to go. However, this other rabbi so-and-so <laughs> said it was only for marital unfaithfulness can you divorce. But they would never say something like, I say to you. They would always refer to somebody else. When Jesus taught, he never said, thus saith the Lord. He never said, Rabbi so-and-so said. When Jesus taught, he always said, verily, verily, I say unto you. I say this. I'm teaching you. So that's why it was fresh. And they said, what's with this new teaching? It wasn't that it was necessarily new in the sense of time, like brand new, like just born baby or something. But it was new in the sense that it was fresh. It was different. It was like, wow. They probably could have listened to him for hours and hours. Wow, look at this authority. Yeah, the way he was teaching. Because um, it was just astonishing. Verse 22 has that word astonished in it. And that means to strike with panic, or in the passive sense, they were struck with astonishment. They were just on the edge of their seat. So in the sense used, the audience was filled with prolonged amazement. Okay? When he was teaching. And I want to read something directly from the study book I use. And this, speaking of that, speaking of the authority he used, the word means literally to be out and was used of that authority which a person has which is delegated to him from someone else. The person delegating the authority is in a sense out of himself and acting in the person to whom he was, to whom he had delegated the authority. So thus the word means delegated authority. The word means also the power of authority and of right. So Jesus wasn't speaking by somebody else's delegated authority. The authority was inside himself, intrinsically, naturally. And so that's why when he spoke with authority, it was, wow. 
Um, it was used in a legal practice of delegating authority. Here it is used of our Lord as having the authority in himself, not derived from others. The rabbis quoted from other rabbis and felt themselves to be expounders of tradition. And felt themselves, yeah, expounders of tradition. The Messiah struck a new note here, and the people were quick to recognize it. They saw that here was a teacher who spoke on his own authority. He did not rely on or use anybody else's authority when he spoke. Moving on to the man possessed. There's a word there, that this man came into their synagogue, indicating he normally wasn't there. Um, it just wasn't his place to be, normally. But the interesting thing was, when you look at this picture and you step back, this demon-possessed man sat there the entire time Jesus taught. Never interrupted, never did anything. But now all of a sudden, there's a boldness come about and, and this, this demon is going to speak up. So he, this man appears to be a visitor to, the synagogue, to their synagogue, seemed to hold his peace through Jesus' teaching. Also, the level of possession is so severe that if you, if when you go into the way it was described, actually in the Greek, it was not the demon, not the the man was demon possessed, but that the demon was possessed of the man. The demon was that in control over him that the man was like almost secondary. Inside the demon is how powerful he was. So, it, 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 a more accurate phrase was the man was in the demon, in his complete sphere of control. The cry the demon made when he spoke, when he spoke out to Jesus, is, is described as a deep throated cry and with fear. When this demon spoke, he trembled. Um, I think there's a verse in James that talks about that. James 2.19. You guys probably already know it, but I'll repeat it anyway. James 2.19 says, You believe that there... Now, this is James. James the one who was the mender of nets. Listen to how he speaks. You believe that there is one God? You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. So what he's saying is, hey, as a, just as a side note, the message James just taught there, you can't just say, I believe in God and expect to go to heaven. Even the demons believe and tremble. <laughs> so for you to say, oh, I believe in God, James says, that ain't going to cut it, man. Because, you, congratulations, you just put yourself on the level of the demons. <laughs> simply by saying you believe in God. Actually, not even on that level because it says they believe and tremble. And here was this demon standing before God the Son, fully possessed with God the Holy Spirit, God the Father in him making reconciliation of us back to him, the full trinity standing there, and this demon has the nerve to even speak. I can see why he stayed quiet while Christ was talking. There's no way he could probably speak. But he said, What? do we have in common? You and me. Christ, I know who you are. Verse 24. Listen to, listen to these words in verse 24. What did the demon say? Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? it would connotate that there was more than one living in there at the time. Mm -hmm. Maybe a whole bunch of them critters. But this dude must have been crawling in his skin with these demonic spirits. However, they recognized his complete authority over all of them. Even though Christ came in the capacity of a man and did not rely upon his godhood or his god nature one bit, not even in describing himself, they still recognized the authority he was capable of and bowed down to that. When it says, verse 25, um, hold thy peace. What does it say? 
Verse 25. Shut up. <laughs> Hold that thought. Be quiet. <laughs> but Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. Is that, what is, is that how it is in the King James? Verse 20. Hold thy peace and come out. You have the King James? Hold thy peace and come out. That's so poetic. So um, Shakespearean. <laughs> Hold thy peace and come out. When you get down to the Greek, Hunston hit it right on the head. The, the King James polished it and took away its impact. What Jesus actually literally said was, Shut up! <laughs> literally. That is what that word means. Shut up is the way he said it. Okay. And the same the same. Strength, the same power is in his command. Come out! It was the same phrase he used when he raised Lazarus from the dead. Come forth! That same strength, unpolished. Jesus was just no bones about it. Shut up, come out. That's it. Did not mince words. More need not be said. Yes, the phrase means to reduce to silence. My notes, I wrote, the true strength of the phrase is shut up. The King James Version <laughs> puts a polish on the phrase, and he says, but come and, and come out. So that phrase, shut up and come out, are with the same stern intensity. And then the, the scripture tells us that with a screech and with a convulsion, probably a little mad that he was going to have to come out, um, he came out. Now, this book explains it and I actually lean very very strongly to if I can find it um, the way they explained it that these demons were lacking a physical body um, this is what the book said, and I actually agree with it. The devil is a fallen angel. Demons constitute a different category of beings from the fact that the demons have no rest unless they're living in some physical body. It seems clear that at one time they did have physical bodies and that they were deprived of them by some judgment of God. Some, including the writer, and I agree with the writer, think that they are the disembodied beings of a pre-Adamic race who inhabited the first earth and that they followed their leader Lucifer into sin and were disembodied and deprived of residence upon the earth by the cataclysm of Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. The earth became without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. Which is coincident with the fall of Lucifer in Isaiah these are the principalities and powers spoken of in Ephesians and comprise the kingdom of Satan in the atmosphere on the earth. I agree with that, that these demonic spirits, they didn't want to leave the man because when lacking a body, it's like they're agitated. They have ants crawling all over them. And then when they possess somebody or something like the pigs, um, they, were, they were more content. So his command to come out was like, oh, man, great, not again. So they had to come out. With a screech and a convulsion, probably out of anger, they came out. And then after that, these, these people, these scribes and people in the synagogue, reasoned among themselves. They, they tried to, to inquire of each other, what is this? Did you see that? This teaching... The reference that they're making is to the whole scene. The way Jesus came into the temple, the way he taught without authority, and the way with authority, I'm sorry, the way he taught without their authority, the way he taught with his own authority, and with his own authority cast out these demons. They were like baffled by it. And they, they didn't know what to say. So they're asking themselves, what about this? The whole scene. His teaching, his command over the demons. And incidentally, his commands... The way he commanded them, that word, the way he commands the demons, it's a military term, which is interesting because the way it's described here is he maintains a military command 
over the whole spiritual realm. In other words, he walking to, up to a miscellaneous group of demons simply says snap to. They snap to. They recognize that authority. It's in a military kind of sense, the way a sergeant would say, drop and give me 20, and that private will drop and give him 20 push-ups. We'll not argue back. We'll simply say, yes, sir, may I do 20 more <laughs> type of situation. That's the authority. Even though these demons are incorrigible and maybe resistant, they will follow. They will obey in an instant the commands of the commander-in-chief. So that's the authority he maintains over the whole spiritual realm. And that's why the Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. They will not, and it won't be because they're forced to. They will do it out of simple awe when God turns up the glory and begins to shine in his brilliance and in his power and in his own authority. Everything will not have a choice but to bow in that presence out of simple awe. You know, we, we might think we're hot stuff in this realm, but when we pass into the next one, we're not going to be such hot stuff. <laughs> not when he turns up that glory and it's like, oh, gee, Dad. <laughs> That's real bright. <laughs> so, and like I said, the last verse there, the, the 28th verse, um, the, the, the reputation about this, the word about this spread real quick. Did you see this? Did you see this? Only when they did it, it's not like, you know, you sit here and pass something around the room by secret, and when it gets back around, it's totally different because it changes. When they told stories, they did it very accurately with detail. They were descriptive. So when this story spread, it was like, you should have seen it. The way he walked into that synagogue, the way he taught, the room was just electric. And then all of a sudden, this demon-possessed man starts screeching, and he says, shut up, and it shut up, and he said, come out, and it came out, and it was just wild. And none of the Pharisees and scribes and Sadducees, none of them could explain it. They were all dumbfounded. You should have seen them all running around like confused little, chickens. Let alone do it. Yeah. Um, the whole scene just started whoosh, spreading all over and and it was all over from then on you know once his reputation started spreading couldn't go anywhere public he had to do his ministry in private um, out in out in the wilderness and desert places because people just flocked to him five thousand at a time and he fed them they were just heard to him but obviously there was something different about him oh yeah i mean he goes by and this is these people who say follow me and they leave whatever they are doing and follow him yeah it, there was, but you, you, it was more on a spiritual level and not on a physical level. You couldn't tell it by the way he looked because he appeared as a normal, average human being. He appeared so average and normal that when in the Garden of Gethsemane they came to arrest him, they had to send somebody out to identify him. They couldn't tell him apart. So Judas went up there and kissed him and identified him. This is the one. Otherwise, he was just a regular person. Nothing that Isaiah said he had nothing desirable about him that we would chase after him. Or, you know, like, oh, wow, he's like nine feet tall, dressed in solid white and shiny. And look at that big old sword he has. There's nothing, nothing like that about Christ. In at fact, I would guess, right, I would guess maybe just the opposite. He might have been a little shorter than everybody else. Maybe kind of, you know, so, so unattractive, that that also set off the, the Pharisees and the, and the leaders like, look at him. And they're all flocking to him? And, and do they really think he is the Messiah? Really? we got to get rid of this one. we we got to get rid of him quick. So that concludes our lesson today. Um, thank you for joining us. We'll be back again next week at the same time. And we'll see you then. Bye.